It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Hi, neighbor. Do you know how special you are? That's why genealogy is important, to let you know just that. You're very special. And thank goodness for Genealogy Gems podcast. That's a new addition to the neighborhood. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Recognize that voice? Hey, it sounds like Mr. Rogers is a genealogy fan. Actually, that is the cousin of today's very special guest, Kathy Lennon. Now, remember in episode 48, in part one of my interview with Kathy, where she was telling us about a cousin that she met who just happened to be Tim Russell, the wonderful voice actor from the radio show and movie, A Prairie Home Companion? Well, I got a chance to talk with Tim recently, and he put together that little intro for the show. And next month, you'll be hearing our conversation about his love of family history and antiques, his amazing career in a very nostalgic profession of being a radio actor. Not too many of those around anymore, are there? And, of course, his work with Garrison Keillor and all the folks at A Prairie Home Companion. Well, do you want to know what it's like to work with Meryl Streep, Woody Harrelson, John C. Riley, and one of my personal favorites, Lily Tomlin? Well, you'll definitely want to tune in next month to episode 50. But right now, you're listening to the Genealogy Gems podcast, episode number 49. It's July of 2008, and I hope you had a wonderful Independence Day. It is really, really hot around here, unusually so. We hit about 110 degrees yesterday, but today it cooled down to the high 80s, and my daughter Lacey and I went out to the country to pick peaches. I always get way too many, but I love them, and now the house smells heavenly. So I'll be peeling and pitting for the next few days, but I can't wait for all those things that my grandmother taught me how to make, peach jam and peach pie and freezing peach slices. We'll have peaches coming out of our ears. So, And it's also time for the county fair in my neck of the woods, and uh, I had a really unique opportunity last week to do something at the fair that I've never done before. Uh, No, I wasn't bungee jumping. Um, I told the premium members about it in a recent episode, but I wanted to mention it here as well because I just thought this was wonderful. Our county fair is running right now, as I said, and one of the local area genealogical societies put together a genealogy booth in the technology exhibit building that they have at the fair. And they have a really nice large section kind of sectioned off in the building. And there are three computers set up and some big maps up on the walls. And so when visitors enter the booth area, uh, they're welcomed by a greeter, someone from the local genealogical society. And they're encouraged to mark on one of the large maps with a pin to represent, you know, where their ancestors have come from. And then if they want to learn more about their family... Uh, They fill out a pedigree chart, and they got to spend several minutes with one of the three volunteer researchers at the computer. Well, this was my first time volunteering, and I have to say, I had a fantastic time. You know, there are many, many things that we do as members of genealogy societies, and I really think that something like this is one of the best activities I've come across. The visitors were, of course, thrilled with anything that we were able to find for them, But I think the real thrill was for those of us who were volunteering as researchers. It is so fulfilling to sit face to face with someone who really hasn't delved into their family history before and be able to give them something tangible, you know, like a printout of a a census record or an immigration record, um, as well as something intangible, which is, of course, a new and exciting appreciation for their family history. Well, just about everyone who visited the booth walked away excited about what they had found and uh, anxious to continue on when they got home. Well, we volunteered in three-hour shifts, and I tell you, the time just flew by. I was really surprised, and it was such a wonderful experience, and my hat is off to those hardworking and dedicated folks who put the whole thing together. You know, the fair is open for two weeks, and the booth was running daily from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., They had three researchers and a greeter constantly on staff, 
So you can imagine the manpower and the organization that would be required to pull that whole thing off. But from what I saw, it really brought awareness to genealogy, both with the visitors as well as the attention it attracted in the local newspapers, which is always a good thing. And I really enjoyed also getting to know the folks in a neighboring society and getting to work with them. You know, that doesn't happen very often. Um, I think projects like this are really the kind of things that will help genealogy societies survive in the computer age. You know, it not only brought researchers face-to-face -face with non-genealogists, but it brought genealogists from neighboring areas together for a really great purpose. And it was just awesome. So um, something to think about for your local genealogy society. You know, so much of what we do at our local genealogy societies it can really be replicated on the Internet. Uh, everything from sharing information, finding out about websites, communicating, talking about different surnames. So many things that we do really are now online. But going to the fair or going to some other local venue and getting a chance to work side by side with other family historians, being able to introduce non-genealogists to genealogy, um, I I'm sorry, but I don't know how you can really replicate that online. This is something that we can do as society members that could really keep our societies vibrant. And um, so anyway, it was a terrific idea. Also this week, the Family History Magazine July 2008 podcast episode was published, as well as a podcasting primer article that I wrote for the magazine. Now, the article will appear in the November 2008 issue, but it's available now free online. And you can find the show and the podcasting primer all about how to find genealogy podcasts, how to listen to them, download them, everything you need to know. Uh, and that's at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And I'll have a link, of course, for you in the show notes for that. Uh, this is episode number 49. The really great thing about the podcasting primer is that it also includes the two instructional videos that I told you about that I produced for Family Tree Magazine. And, you know, some folks, they really shy away from podcasts because they think it's going to be too technical. And uh, I can appreciate that. It's not always really user-friendly technology when you're first getting started. But I am sure that those folks will find that the article and the videos will explain everything and walk them through finding and listening to genealogy podcasts, really step by step. So I'll have a link in the show notes directly to the primer so you can easily share it with your friends and your genealogy society. And in fact, it would be a great resource for you to share with the editor of your genealogy society newsletter. Newsletter editors are always looking for things to include in the newsletters, and this would benefit everybody in your group, so I encourage you to do that. Well, enough about what I've been doing. It's been busy, busy around here, but um, I have been having a lot of fun hearing about what you all have been doing, and so let's head to the mailbox. I love hearing what you listeners have been up to and how you're taking the gems that you're hearing about on the show and putting them to good use. Here is an audio clip from Genealogy Gems premium member Maureen Steffen, who told us about how one of the gems she put to very good use and may have uh, stumbled into a bit of a gold mine. Hi, Lisa. My name is Maureen Steffen, and I just recently started listening to your podcast. And because one of your suggestions about um, the Google searches, um, I'm doing the genealogy for my family, of course, and um, I came across some um, unclaimed property that had a lady with our last name, and our last name is pretty unusual. So I was thinking that, you know, there must be some way that I could find her if she was still living, and I actually talked to her this morning and she um, lives in Florida, and I told her that she had this unclaimed property in Michigan, and she was just thrilled, and uh, I think it will help her out. And I just wanted to tell you that this was just something that happened that I never thought would happen with doing my genealogy, but it was really cool because I think it, it's going to help somebody. And I made a connection with her. She um, 
I've added her to my family tree and um, on Ancestry.com, and um, hopefully I'll be able to learn more about that branch of the family because of, the, of what's happened with this. So just wanted to tell you that that was a really cool thing that happened, and thank you very much for your wonderful podcast. It's helped me out immensely. Have a good day. Bye. Isn't that cool? Can you imagine finding lost property? <laughs> um, that was, and it was kind of neat that it led to a connection with um, somebody else across the country for Maureen. Um, so anyway, thanks so much for sharing, Maureen. That was really fun to hear. Coming up next, we've got a little bit of trivia from the U.S. Census Bureau. Profile America, Friday, July 18th. The first of what would be a spate of train robberies in the U.S., occurred this month in 1873, pulled off by a gang headed by Jesse James and his brother Frank. Their target was a train of the Chicago, Rock Island and Pacific Railroad as it passed a spot near Adair, Iowa. The gang found only $2,000 in the express car's safe, so they methodically robbed the frightened passengers of another $1,000. Jesse James was killed in 1882, and the last train robbery in the nation occurred around 1900. But today, there are still some 417,000 robberies in the U.S. The largest number occur on the nation's streets and highways. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. In episode 48, we got started on my interview with Kathy Lennon of the Lennon Sisters. Kathy is such a sweetheart and so fun to talk to that I couldn't bear to edit any of our conversation. So I'm bringing it to you in two parts, and today is part two of that conversation. In this episode, Kathy talks about the tragic death of her father, the strength of character of her mother, and all she taught her family of 11 children. She shares some insight into being a famous Lennon sister and tells us about her newest venture, which has a bit of a family history twist to it. And at the end of the interview, I'll tell you how premium members can enter for a chance to win a pair of Kathy and Janet Lennon's adorable Best Pal dolls. But first, I asked Kathy about the artistic entertainer DNA that seems to run through her family. You know, I was looking up some um, newspaper articles about Bert and his family um, back when they were in um, the Wisconsin area, or he had gone back to visit, I guess. Mm -hmm. He was probably living somewhere else. But it mentioned something about um, him being involved in some kind of entertainment activity. or It just seemed like that there was kind of an entertainer um, thread running through that family even way back then. Oh, it just is. I mean, for Grandma Lennon to be um, a ballerina, right, and her father... Um, she was from Munich, Germany, mm -hmm. and her father was the dance master in Munich. Oh, wow. So um, he, and that, that's what he does. He, he taught dancing, and then she was a prima ballerina, and she came over. And then Bert Lennon, uh, Grandpa Bert, was a wonderful um, singer, had a beautiful, beautiful voice, mm. and he taught his boys to sing, and that's how our dads started singing and went into the being the Lennon brothers, um, and um, until they had 24 children among the four of them, they just couldn't <laughs> travel. They needed to get real jobs. Right. So they, you know, and Daddy sang, oh, my gosh, he had his own, yeah, he had his own concert at the Hollywood Bowl. Really? 15 years old. We have beautiful posters of that. And um, uh, it's just incredible talent that just runs through the whole family. There's just no doubt about it. Now, what led him to the Hollywood Bowl? He was um, a child uh, protege under Franco and Marco. I want to say Marco, Franco and Marco. It was a group that traveled and took entertainers with them, and they would put together a show. Oh. Daddy would sing at church. He sang for weddings. He would sing for funerals as a young boy to make extra money. Just a beautiful Irish tenor voice. Oh. And um, and at one point, in fact, we have letters from from so many people uh, about Daddy's voice and young Billy Lennon, and um, and he was at uh, one of the performances where Daddy sang at Venice High School, and he said, "I would love to have him in part of our show," um, and it was to raise money for World War One 
bonds. Right. More bonds. And so Daddy sang at the young age of 15, and we have it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful billboard that's all folded up, but it says Master Billy Lennon, oh. you know, soloist for, and then it says the Hollywood Bowl, so he had his own concert. And, um, and then many other things also, and then he also was asked to sing the song Dear California uh, for President Herbert Hoover. Um, because he was a, a son of California, and he, when he became president, they wanted to send him this record of Dear California. So we have pictures of, they asked Daddy to sing it, and we have pictures of Daddy um, recording the, the record, and then him handing it to the conductor of a train, this record, oh my that is going to the president. And then we have a picture of the president sitting with his dog, and, and it's signed to Billy Lennon. Thank you so much, President Herbert Hoover. So, um, and, and I know that how a lot of those things happened is because Grandpa Bert, being in PR and marketing, <laughs> knew how to get a hold of people and, and say, well, have you ever thought of having, you know, whatever, uh, because he was that kind of a guy. And, um, and that's how Daddy did that also. So, um, some beautiful history, family stories of of music and performing. And for the Lennon sisters in our family, the Bill Lennon family, mm-hmm. on our mom's side, um, our Grandpa Denning uh, was an old song and dance man, and he taught me my low harmony part. And oh, he would wow. play that honky-tonk piano in more bars than you know you could imagine. He went from bar to bar playing honky-tonk piano, but he was a song and dance man. And, and, and mom's mother um uh she was also a dancer um and she was in a couple of silent movies and just a beautiful beautiful woman that was our uh our nana who lived with us all our life she, oh. she was 94 and her name was reina isabel alvarez um, and that's the mexican spanish side of of our family her mother was from spain and her father was from mexico and um so we've got you know Great stories and history on both sides, and music just running through the veins. So you just had not only the the music, but the the dancing coming at you from DNA. You know, exactly. <laughs> because I, still the, think, I still am trying to push Janet to do Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> she'd be oh, fabulous. she She's would be natural. wonderful. She's a natural. She'd be great. <laughs> oh wow. Well, and. That, you know, it's funny, your story about your father being heard um, and kind of picked up by someone to um, kind of move his career forward. That's a lot of what happened to you and your sisters, isn't it? Exactly. It was basically, um, we sang at our church, same thing, sang Mm -hmm. at St. Mark's Catholic Church in Venice, California, where I think probably a good 70 of us have been you know, baptized and, and First Communion and married there and oh my. <laughs> children baptized there. I mean, St. Mark's has been our real family parish for years. Right. And we sang for a um, church musical that everybody took part. Everybody in the church did something. And my dad and his brothers, as the Lennon brothers, uh, performed. And they said, wouldn't it be fun to have the girls sing with us in one number? So we did a little song called uh, Them Bones, and it was uh, (laughs) Them Bones, Them Bones, Them Dry Bones. Mm -hmm. We dressed as little skeletons, and they had little outfits on with bow ties, like a barbershop quartet look, and we were little bones, and we did with them, and we sang with them, harmony and all. And then we also did um, a Scottish medley, and we sang that. And in the audience, and this was about in 1954... 53 and 54, so we were little. I mean, yeah. six, I think, at the time. And and in the audience, um, or seven, and the audience was Daddy's boss. Uh, Daddy was a milkman at that time for Edgemar Farms, one of the things he did. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, gee, you know, your girls sing so great. Would they consider coming and singing uh, for uh, a Lions Club or Rotary Club or the different community clubs? And uh, we'll pay them like $10. And at the time, there were eight children and mom and dad and our grandmother in a two-bedroom house. Oh, my goodness. And Daddy said, you know, came to us and said, would you girls consider doing this? If you did, we can put the money away and maybe make a dormitory uh, in the back of the house with like, <laughs> a bed and a dresser and a bed and a dresser, and you girls could have your own place. And, and uh, we said, well, that would be fun. That would be great. So we started to do a couple of these 
community club uh, places that we would sing and make $10 here and $12 here. And, and one night, uh, we were asked to sing um, for a Halloween party, and uh, Larry Welk Jr. at the time, Lawrence Welk's son, right? Um, he was 15 years old. Our sister Dee Dee was 15 years old. And she, he also went to St. Monica's High School, where uh, Dee Dee was going to school. And he invited her to his Halloween party. And she said, I really can't go. I need to sing. And he said, well, what if I come pick you up? And she, and, you know, she said, well, you could do that. And he said, I'll bring you up to the house. So he came to the place where we were performing. And he thought she was singing just with a vocal group or some, you know, school. Mm -hmm. And realized that he heard us sing. And he said, I didn't know you sang with your sisters. You sing really well. And I'm going to tell my dad about you. (laughs) And at that time, Mr. Welk's national television show had been on for about six months um, on ABC. Prior to that, we had watched it um, over a local channel called KTLA in Los Angeles. And we'd been on that for, um, I think, about a year and so he had gone national, and she said, I'm going to tell my dad about you. And Dee Dee came home and told us, and we didn't think much of it, and we didn't hear anything. And then about a month later, uh, Larry called one Sunday morning and said, Dee Dee, get your sisters, I don't care where they are, get up here and sing for my dad. He has a cold and can't get out of the house, <laughs> and I've bugged him so much. Um, quick, get up here. So Daddy rounded us all up, and we went up to Mr. Welk's house, and, oh, my gosh, Lisa, it was unbelievable. It was like a um, going into a movie set or something. It's really? It's a beautiful old Spanish house in, in Brentwood, California, and it was an old, gorgeous, gorgeous area. And we walked into the house, and Mr. Welk walks out, and he had on this maroon satin smoking jacket. Oh. And he had on, like, slippers, velvet slippers, and he indeed had a cold, but... He walked out, and it was like, you know, oh, my gosh, it was this movie star. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was, it was so incredible to all us little girls, you know. And uh, he came out, and he said, my son has been bothering me so much <laughs> about listening to you and hearing you, so please sing right now. And it was like, oh, my gosh. No and pressure. I, I, yeah. And, again, Dee Dee and Larry, they were just 15 years old. And oh. um, so 15 and a half, actually. So that's why Larry was driving. I always think, how oh, come he was picked her up, you know. And um, so I went over and hit the note of C and came back, and we sang the spiritual he that had been made famous by the McGuire sisters. Mm-hmm. He can turn the tide and calm the angry sea. And we sang that to him. And he said, uh, he, he couldn't believe it. He says, will you sing that again if I get my producer on the, show, on the phone? And he called his producer, <sighs> and we sang to him over the phone. Over the phone. And, and he said, uh, I would love to have you... Um, be on my Christmas Eve show, and that's my first Christmas show, uh, national, and it was Christmas Eve, 1955, mm. and we were on for 13 years every Saturday night after that. Isn't that amazing? The only audition we've ever done in our lives. Now, how old were you at that time? I was 12. How does a 12-year-old <laughs> handle a situation oh, it, like it that? It was amazing, because I was in seventh grade, and I was very embarrassed to tell any of my friends, because I didn't want them to know I was on television because I thought that they would be think that I thought I was big, you know. Uh-huh. Like I, I was so embarrassed, and, and I didn't want to tell anybody. And, and I remember my mom sat me down and said, "You, because you Mr. Welk asked us again and again and again, and right. I wasn't telling anybody. And then, of course, the church started knowing it, and everybody started <laughs> talking about it. And my mom said, you will know when your friends are really your friends, because there's going to be those that are going to be so happy for you. And they're going to love to be able to see you. Wouldn't you love to see one of your friends on television? And those that don't or make fun or tease you, well, they weren't going to be your friends anyway. So Mm -hmm. you just need to be proud of what you're doing. But it was really hard for me at that age. Really, that's such a difficult age anyway. And, um, you know, because I wasn't really grown up like Dee Dee and Peggy. They were 13 and 15. I was kind of more grown up, or 14 and 15. And and Janet was just nine. So, um, you know, the two of us were the little guys. And uh, always more hung out more together uh, mm-hmm. than Dee Dee and Peggy. They were in high school already, and we were in grammar school. So, and um, I'm sure because many of my listeners have already written me and said that they um, 
kind of grew up watching you and, and adoring what you guys did and playing with your paper dolls. Um, what was just the experience like? Work, you know, you were working girls at a very young age and still going to school. Oh, what was it like to be a Lennon sister on the Wilkes show? Well, it, it was two things. It was a phenomenal, I've had a phenomenal career. Mm-hmm. We have sung for over seven presidents. Wow. We, have, we have gone over, oh, I think we've been to 49 of the states. The only place we haven't been is Alaska mm-hmm. um, performing. We have met and worked with some of the greatest celebrities, the, the all-time, the George Burns, the Bob Hopes, the Bing Crosbys, Perry Como. Amazing. Um, it, you know, that you, you just can't. You can't tell anybody what Jack Benny was like or what Sammy <laughs> Davis Jr. was like. Right. It was, it was, we were always kind of in la-la land, staring at them, couldn't believe it, and they'd come in and they'd go, Kathy, could you? You know, and I'd go, he knows my name. <laughs> like, <laughs> you still felt, you know, just the Lennon kids from around the corner that happened to sing. Yeah. And um, we had, looking back, there are two ways of looking at my career. One is, as a um, young girl and doing that show every week, Um, Mom and Dad kept us very, very focused, and uh, we would do the show. They worked around our school hours. It Mm. was live for 10 years going to New York. Oh, my uh, gosh. From ABC Studios in Los Angeles, Hollywood, actually, um, at 6 o'clock on Saturday night. We performed for 10 years, Um, and we'd come home, and we would still do the dishes, change our little brothers and sisters' diapers. Um, You know, we had a normal life. Mm -hmm. Mom and Dad never wanted to send us to Hollywood professional schools, so we went to the same schools we went to before we sang. Right. And so our friends pretty much knew who we were, and it was just, oh, Kathy, oh, it was just Janet. You know, it was just Peggy, just Dee Dee. The only time we knew we were a little bit different is if children would be transferred from a different state and they'd come to the school, and they'd go, we hear you have a Lennon sister in your school. Oh. And they'd go, oh, you mean Kathy? <laughs> you know, I mean, it didn't mean that much. And that's the only time, and I'd be a little bit embarrassed. Aren't you one of the Lennon sisters? I can't believe it. And I'd be real embarrassed in front of my friends that anybody would say that. And they were all excited for me, but I was like, oh, gosh, you know, I'm not different than anybody else. And, um, and then they'd find out soon that I wasn't. I still went to the pep rallies and did the sock hops and did right. as I could to be involved in our school. And mom and dad made a beautiful decision by doing that, and I, I, we highly respect them for having us have as normal a life as possible. And, um, you know, we didn't date singly till we were 16, and we didn't have our own um, cars. We went to school in a bus. A sc- mm-hmm. our, it wasn't even a school bus. It was the city bus. We didn't have school buses at the Catholic school, so we had city bus. We just, Janet and I had walked, to, I mean, we'd sing on the Perry Como show or Ed Sullivan, come back, walk to the bus stop, and take the bus to school. Oh. And it kept us normal. Yeah. And we've always said our singing and our performance is really not, and our, our professional career and being really, we're told by so many, an American institution, I mean, mm-hmm. an icon in, in American entertainment. And and yet it doesn't define who we are. Right. You know, I'm still just Kathy Lemon, Darius. I'm, you know, I'm a wife. I'm, I'm a, a, a sister. I'm a, an aunt. And, an, and you know, it, it, that is who I am. And so um, we, we have been blessed that way, I really feel, because of mom and dad and their attitude of what performing was all about. That's such a, a good point because I can imagine even, you know, these days, fame could be, you know, huge one day and gone the next, and they had no guarantees. So what a wonderful blessing to know that you would always have that stability in your life regardless of whatever happened with your career. And, of course, thankfully it turned out amazing. But um, <laughs> so you really got the best of both, you know, it well, sounds we, like. We did. We, we I mean... We wrote a uh, autobiography called Same Song, Separate Voices, oh. and um, it really pretty much tells our story, tells a lot of um, uh, history, family history and all, mm-hmm. and um, we do have, uh, uh, I think I've, I've sent you off, but our, our website, the LennonSisters.com, right. and um, it has, we do sell our autobiography, and that really ha- has a lot of inside 
fun stories of all the things through the years and and um, and then on our family also and the tragedies we've been through. Right. Uh, people so often think of us as living in a, a land of of perfect um, little crinoline skirts and dancing t- with an accordion and and singing and having this perfect little sweetheart life. And as much as we were, we have had a, a, a blessed life. In so many ways, in an incredible career, we've also, as everyone else has, we have gone through many, many tragedies. Yes. Um, one being our one of our sisters. There were actually twelve children. Um, our sister Mary, when she was uh, sixteen months old, was hit by a car and killed. And we had that when Mom was uh, pregnant with our brother Billy. Um, she was like in her ninth month, and mm. our little sister Mary was killed. And we, that was one of the first tragedies in our life as to, oh, you know, life can change so quickly. Yes. And then, and then within our career, if, it, if we hadn't sing, maybe this wouldn't have happened. We, you know, you never know. We do believe God's plan is perfect, so you, but you never understand so much of it. Mm-hmm. And, and one being that if your listeners didn't know, and I, I, w- I would assume you might know, Lisa, but that our father was murdered by a Lennon sister a fan, right? And that was a, you know, something that it's like a movie that you see or something. It's so very, very difficult to realize what we went through, what our family has been through. And I, I look back on that, and and he was a fan. Um, Daddy trusted everybody as we all did, mm-hmm. and uh, this man was demented and felt he was married to our sister Peggy. Oh. And um, he felt that Daddy was keeping her from him. And Peggy was married and had four children and expecting her fifth. And um, uh, he, he was in an, a, an institution and he escaped. Oh, and my gosh. And um, shot and killed our dad. And our family, Mom was still at home with seven children under 18. Mm-hmm. And um, so... We had to just totally regroup, and and the strength of mom's faith mm-hmm. and um, the strength of our family um, could not have been held together if it were not for mom and the way we were brought up and the love of dad and mom and the love for each other. And um, it, it was a story that we don't tell very often. We, right. we do tell it in our book. Uh, but it's one of those things that uh, it was one of the very first stalkers. Um, you hear it all the time, yes. people having people, uh, you know, in the celebrity world, but this was one of the very first um, that um, ended in, a, in, in the worst tragedy possible. And um, so our career has been um, a beautiful thing and, and also along the way has been life. Mm -hmm. and um, so it it was amazing because when we wrote our book our autobiography it's called I I think I said it's called same song separate voices meaning each of us tell a certain part of a story from our viewpoint Uh, Dee Dee looked at doing the Mickey Mouse Club at 17 totally differently than Janet looking at it at 10. Right. You know, like we were right. so excited to go to the Disney Studios and be with the Mouseketeers, and Dee Dee's friends were all teasing her about <laughs> dancing on the Mickey Mouse Club. So, <laughs> you know, and so the separate voices are coming from each of us in a different way of how we uh, feel about our career and what we went through. And when we did the chapter on Daddy, Daddy's death, um, it was amazing because we had not talked about it Mm. Uh, for probably 10 years or 12 years. We had not even discussed it because we we just, we lived it right. and we went on. And it was very cathartic. Uh, we would even say to each other, what? I didn't know you were da-da-da-da. You know, we, uh, and um, it, it was, um, it was very hard to get through. Yeah. Uh, but it was um, very cleansing. And um, so, actually, even writing the whole book was an incredible experience. I always say everyone should write the history of their family. Everybody should write it down and tell stories, and because it is um, not only leave, leaving it for 
other family members, but for yourself mm-hmm. to be able to get things out that maybe you never discussed or you never thought about or you didn't know the other one felt that way. Or um, uh, it, we were, it took us almost 10 years to write it. Oh, I imagine. And, and if you could, when you get the book, because um, uh, I, I would love to send one to you. Um, oh, I would love to read it. Your mom must, and I know she was, must have just been an amazing woman. When I he listened to you talk about your story about your father and, and knowing the kind of responsibility she had, the kind of faith that she had, and the fact that through that kind of completely unforeseen tragedy, down to all the way of having to go back over it and writing the book, and your mom is still there, keeping you grounded, keeping you focused. Yes. Tell us a little bit. Now, she was known as Sis, is that right? She named, yes, her brother called her Sis. Her name was also Isabel, named after our grandmother. Right. Um, and um, mom, she had one brother, Danny, and um, she uh, came from a divorced family uh, when she was very young. Uh, she was like six years old, and she took care of her little brother who was four. Oh. Her mom had to work, and her dad was, uh, like I said, honky-tonk, running through the bars, playing every bar in the world, mm. uh, and um, had a little bit of that alcohol problem, so mm-hmm. he wasn't there a lot, and she adored him, but he was gone a lot trying to get jobs, and she was raised by her mom, who always worked for uh, Seas Candy, and uh, was a candy dipper, like Lucy. <laughs> and Nana used to be able to look in in the boxes and tell us just by the swirl on the top what kind of candy yeah. it was. <laughs> That's a little aside. But um, anyway, Mom, she was an amazing woman. She went to 34 different grammar schools. Oh, my That's word. That's how often she moved. And she, because they moved with ants, and cousins, and every couple months they were moving. And she said it was so horrible going into the principal's office that often and waiting and then being introduced to the class and saying, this is our new student. And she said, it just every time I'd have to go to school, I'd cry, you know, mm. sit there and have to be in 34 different grammar schools. And then she ended up going to Venice High School, and she went all years to, to Venice High School, all four years. Mm-hmm. That's the longest she stayed there, and that's where she met our dad. And Dad was one of nine children, and uh, he saw her at a at a football game. Um, she was one of the uh, girls sitting up in the stand, and she w- knew exactly what was happening in the game. She was yelling for the game. The other <laughs> girls up there were putting on their lipstick. They were talking to each other. She knew football. They were worrying about the cheers, and Mom was into the game. Yeah. And Daddy fell in love with her right there. I bet. Because <laughs> she was such a sports fanatic. And... And they started dating, and she would go over to his house with all the brothers and sisters and, and sister and see this crazy family. And she said to Daddy, she said, Billy, that's what I want. Hmm. Um, I want a large family. I want millions of children, and I want no arguing in the house. And, um, and that's what she had. She, she demanded it with such calmness and um, an attitude of love and respect and discipline and, and boundaries that um, uh, were, were so, what can I say, so grounded mm-hmm. in, in raising a family. I, I can't say enough about our mom without sounding like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, whose mom is that great? But this, I, I lived at home until I was 23, longer than the other girls. Mm-hmm. And um, she just was at peace in her heart. Mm-hmm. So everything around her um, was, you know, like you hear the expression, don't sweat the small stuff or mm-hmm. whatever. She had so many big things in her life that had happened to her that she had such faith in God that she, um, she was just strong to the, to the degree of um, trying to put it in the words that I, I try and make you understand it. Um, her foundation was so yes. strong. And so, you know, little things she allowed to happen and it was like, okay, that's all right. You know, we can go on with that. And she was just very confident in herself as a mother, uh, as a wife, 
and um, she stayed at home always. Mm -hmm. She never learned to drive. Oh. (laughs) She walked to the grocery store, which is at the corner of the house, I mean, a corner of our street when we were little. She would walk, and she said that was her time to be alone. Yeah. And and that was her time to get away from the mess, is she'd go to the store (laughs) every day and walk her little cart, and down she'd go. She was just a phenomenal woman. Um, she died, uh, it's been three years now. Right. It's very difficult on all of us because uh, mom not only was the mom, but she also became the dad to the seven youngers. Uh, mm-hmm. She was the parent uh, for them, although all of us took over and became all their parents. But um, she was the mom and dad for them. And... Um, I never heard her complain. I never heard, oh, I can't stand it. You kids, get outside, get out from under my feet, or any of that. It's just, and I, I'd ask her, you know, because she was 85, uh, almost 86 when she died. I'd say, Mom, man, how did you do it? And she'd say, I loved you. Mm-hmm. I loved you all. She said, I hated when school uh, um, went back to, when you kids went back to school after the summer. I didn't want you to go back. I just loved having you around. And she would. She would play jacks on the floor with us. She'd do, you know, hula hoops. She'd play baseball in the backyard. You know, she had a a great story, Lisa, she used to do, and and parents could do this today, Uh I feel. When we wanted something or needed something, a toy of some kind, uh, let's say we wanted some skates, she would buy the skates. Of course, in that those days, you didn't have shoe skates. You had them where you could adjust them according right. to the size. With a key. And you had a key, exactly. <laughs> um, and mom would get the skates for herself, and then we had to borrow them from her. <gasps> so nobody said, well, those are mine, or those are, you know, they were mom. Oh. And she would say, okay, who wants skate? Then she'd hand me one, and then she'd hand Janet another one, and we'd skate with one skate. <laughs> and then we could skate together. You know, a lot of times we always laughed and said, yeah, but we had to go around the other sides of the block opposite each other because one had a right foot and one had a left foot. <laughs> but that's what she'd say. She had a bike. We could yeah. borrow her bike. Oh, she, and very she, they smart. Were her jacks. And so we wanted to play jacks. We'd ask Mom, and then she'd get the jacks out. And I just think it's such an incredible way of raising kids. What a brilliant woman. <laughs> yeah, really brilliant. And then um, she would do that, and then she also says, when um, people would ask her in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, how did you do it with so many children? How did you do it? How did you raise them all? You know, and she says, and kids today, you know, they have timeouts and they've got, you know, and, you, and, and they don't listen and you've got to listen to their feelings and all that. And she said, well, I'll tell you what the downfall is I feel in so many children who are making scenes in grocery stores or at restaurants, and parents go, well, you know, they don't want to be here, type thing. <laughs> and she said, it started with, they got rid of the playpen. And uh-huh. she said to me, the playpen was their first boundary. Mm-hmm. And they got to be in that, and they got my Tupperware and my wooden spoons, and they played, and I'd roll them to the next room while I ironed or whatever I needed to do, mm-hmm. but they stayed in the playpen. Mm-hmm. And they couldn't go, pick me up, hold me, hold me, hold me. She said, Women today don't have play pens. They don't use play pens. Or they have little porta play that they just put them down for take their nap, but they carry them on their hip. Yeah. Or they have to, or they put everything down because the baby is needing me. And she said, and that to me was a, something that I felt that the world kind of hurt themselves and parenthood kind of changed when they got rid of the big old play pens. <laughs> and it was kind of a free-for-all. <laughs> that funny? I just think that's much as funny as they were their first boundaries. Oh. They don't have the boundaries today that they should have. <laughs> they have to learn that you're not always going to get a yes. And that's coming from a woman who probably didn't have a lot of boundaries in the kind of chaotic home chaotic that she was home growing up people. with. She said that she heard, you know, crying and screaming and, yeah. and yelling and and drinking and all these things that she just said she used to hate so much. And and then she said, I'm not going to have that. But she's, she a, she's a wonderful testament to me. Uh, and I'm sure we've got listeners, uh, and I, for one, came from a home, you know, with divorce and all that. And, um, you know, God gives us two opportunities. He gives us the home we were born into. And then we get this amazing second chance to create the home we want. And it sounds like your mother is a living testament to the fact that you can make a good life, even if there's some bad childhood. 
in that um, she was able to create the life that she dreamed of and was thankful for it every day, it sounds like. That's exactly. She did. Yeah. She really did. And she said, I could have drug all of that behind me and said, oh, well, this is why I'm that way. Or I, I could have made all these excuses of all the things that didn't happen right for me. Right. Because of my childhood. But she says, you have to make that decision. You have to be able to say, I don't want that. And I'm going to change the, I'm going to change it. Because the first, you know, childhood isn't our fault, but it's our fault if we get that second family opportunity and then we just drag all, drag all the mud with us. Yeah. And that's just awesome. I, she's just an amazing inspiration. Oh, uh, just everything you've said about her. Now, I want to share with you that uh, one of my listeners has a question for you. Sure. This is from Melissa Barker. Uh-huh. And she says, in all your travels and times as part of the Lennon Sisters, did you collect memorabilia along the way? As genealogists, we collect family memorabilia and label it and organize it. I wondered if you were doing this while you were performing and now have a collection of tangible memorabilia to reminisce about. Interesting. What I do have, I, I, don't, I didn't um, actually collect things every place we performed. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were always so busy, and we would go to the airport, and then we'd go to the place we rehearsed, and then we would perform, and then we would leave, and then we'd stay at the hotel and get in late. So our our schedule on the road was always, traveling was very hard for us. None of us liked to fly. We were petrified of flying. We had terrible flights very often. And and so it was one of those where, you know, you you just did what you had to do and you just wanted to get home. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't do that, but through the years, what I have collected, I am a a picture lover, uh, Mm -hmm. photographs. And I have photographs from almost every place we've performed. And I have postcards that have us performing like in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Lennon Sisters with like a plane flying our name in the back behind oh. it. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And I have pictures of us, you know, with the mayor getting the key to the city. Mm-hmm. Or I have, I have one that you, you'll crack up and this is what I have pictures of. So this, I guess you could say picking up memorabilia of what our road trips were like. Not necessarily one particular thing that I would choose, like a thimble or, you know, something like that. Right. But um, whenever we would perform, we were kind of known that we were raised Catholic, Mm -hmm. and we'd always hear from the diocese, the Catholic diocese, that the priests and the nuns would want us to come out and visit them and say hello, or uh, (laughs) we'd have to stop by the church and the rectory where the priests lived or the convent where the nuns lived to say hello, and it happened so often, and we'd be so tired of doing a show on Saturday night and Sunday morning. We'd have to go, and we'd go to Mass, and then we'd go over, and they always fed us lemonade and cookies. Like, every <laughs> place we went, lemonade and cookies. How'd you keep those amazing figures? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And we'd look at that and go, oh, and we'd have to be nice to them. <laughs> and um, I think, and so um, I have pictures of us with so many nuns and so many priests, and we still pull those out every once in a while and say, how many nuns and priests? And we'd always have them pray for us to pray for our flights. So since we're all still here, evidently it works. Yes, it sounds <laughs> like it. Flying. Oh, how wonderful. Now, I have to ask you about, because, you know, you've told us some wonderful things about your mom, and I know that your mom is kind of behind this new venture that you've got going with Janet with your best pal dolls. So tell us all about them. They're adorable. Well, yeah, we're very, very excited. Um, a few years ago, after Dee Dee and Peggy retired from Branson here, and our now younger sister Mimi sings with us here oh. in Branson, uh, which is it, it's so great because she used to fill in when the girls were uh, having babies and uh-huh. call her our relief pitcher, you know, our <laughs> relief singer, and we'd have Mimi come in and she'd perform. Well, when Peggy retired from here, she called Mimi and said, do you want to, you know, perform in Branson? And she moved here, and she's been singing with us now, and this will be her I think ninth uh, season, or eighth season with us. Wow. And uh, we perform... We open November 1st with Tony Orlando yeah. uh, at the Welk Resort uh, for five weeks of a Christmas show. So we do that. Mimi came and joined us, and Didi, and then Didi retired, and so it's been the three of us. And Janet and I, being the two little ones, we always called each other best pals. We always sang together in the backyard, and we were the best cowboys, and we, <laughs> and we would you know, sit and sing to our dollies. And our favorite dolls were our rag dolls uh, that were made for us by our grandmother, Nana, and our mom. 
on Christmas Eve when Janet was just three and I was six. Uh, we went running into the living room and hanging out of their stockings. Uh, Mom and Nana helped Santa out a little bit that that year oh. and uh, were these beautiful 16-inch rag dolls. And we loved them. And, and a few years ago, Janet and I said, you know, let's, let's record our favorite childhood songs that were sung to us by our grandparents and, and um, our mom and dad and, and our older sisters, Dee Dee and Peggy, and, and let's record our favorite CDs, I mean, t- favorite childhood songs, and call it Best Pals Sing in Childhood Songs. So, um, and because we had written a song when we were little called We Are Pals, Best of Pals, and we, we used to sing that to each other all the time. Aww. So we recorded that. We are pals, best of pals. We are pals, we are pals, we are best of pals. Won't you come over to my house? Won't you come over? And then we did Won't You Come Over to My House? And mm-hmm. and we did Tura Lura Lura, just some really neat old lullabies and songs. I live in the house across the way. I'll buy you candy and sweet things. Your hair in a curl. Won't you come over to my house and play that you're my little girl? I have a dear little dolly, and her eyes are bright blue. She can open and shut them, and she smiles at me too. In the morning I dress her and we go out to play But I like best to rock her at the close of the day Rock her. Oh, I love that song. After we recorded that, we said, you know, we, the, one, the dolls that we used to sing to and loved more than anything are our rag dolls. And we both still have our rag dolls. From really? When we were babies. That's another thing amazing of Mom. Here she had all these children, all these, and we still have things that we had as childhood that she helped us keep, no Aww. matter what. So um, we loved those little dolls, and we said, what if we recreate um, our rag dolls? Um, we said, there's kind of a hole in the toy industry today for uh, old-fashioned dolls mm-hmm. and a soft rag doll. And, you know, there there's always room for the trendies and the technos, but there's nothing to replace a soft, soft doll that you can go to sleep with. And... We decided to uh, have them reproduced right down to their vintage fabric, which matches the vintage fabric on our rag dolls that were made for us in the late 40s. And um, it just kind of like took off that we we launched them at Mall of America in Minneapolis. And um, we have gone from having our beautiful dolls recreated right down the yarn. They have yarn hair, and they've got embroidered faces, just exactly like the ones Mom and Nana made. And Mom saw the beginnings of it when we started thinking about it, and she heard our record, our CD, and we showed her the dolls in different... We kept getting people sending them in to, you know, uh, we would have people... um, send their samples to us from different companies and she'd go, oh, they don't have that yet. No, that's not, <laughs> right. that's not the nose that Nana and I made, you know. And we finally found this company, but she never got to see the finished product. We know she's looking at, over us at, to, right now and has seen the product, you know, in the spiritual world. But, right. Um, at this point, we love them, but we feel Mom and Nana's spirit in every single one of them. So we've recreated those. They have been really well um, accepted and loved because we also, Lisa, we, it was so important for us to find a doll that um, would allow younger children or young girls to stay younger a little longer if they wanted to. Yes. And um, we have since uh, reproduced them and now made our multicultural dolls and we named um, the lighter brown skin with brown hair after mom we called her isabel because mom being of mexican descent right and we have isabel and then we have the darker skin 
uh, more Afro-American, uh, is Sophia. And then we have Lily, who is um, real pale skin with black, black hair. So you have you know, all the different color skins and different color hair, and, and they're all 16-inch rag dolls, the embroidered faces, and uh, they also have uh, little, their dresses are also um, retro. Um, Isabel is wearing one that I had in my first grade, just like my first grade dress. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and then, um, and then we made them little dollies. Uh, Janet's little granddaughters came in and said, they have to have dolls of their own. <laughs> They've kind of been pushing all our samples along, uh-huh. <laughs> and they, they have to have them. So then we made the little tiny Best Pals doll, and they come in a tiny little suitcase um, that kids carry. In fact, the people who have been buying them said they call them their church dolls because if they drop them, they don't make noises. Oh, yes. They take that little suitcase in the car with them. And... Um, and then we have, uh, because of Janet's grandchildren, we have the little Best Pals pets. We have a little uh, dog, which is called Stinky Puppy. And then we have a little Mitty Kitty. And they come in a little bag. And we have Christmas dolls that are in red and green velvet. And they have their little Christmas dolls that go with them that are little five-inch dolls. And um, Janet and I recorded our Best Pals uh, Christmas album. And... Uh, it's so good because Janet's grandchildren uh, sing on it with us. Oh, it's very precious. And so, and all of those, uh, we're right now in the middle of um, recording our third CD. It'll be Best Pals Sing Together, and we're having some really fun songs we're putting on that, and with her grandchildren also. And um, so it has just blossomed. We we just got back from um, Disney World. Mm-hmm. And they're interested in uh, carrying them at Disney, and we just heard that. So that's that's news for you. That's exciting. <laughs> I, mean, I just got an email this morning. So, oh. Um, it looks like they will be carrying our dolls. and we're But we're in uh, doll stores all across the United States, and our website is bestpals.net, www.bestpals.net. And also there's a link to lendingsisters.com and vice versa. So you can see the different products and the different um, things that Janet and I are just uh, very excited about. We're going to have a little tin tea set, just like the one we used to have that was in China, but it's Aww. tin, and it comes in a little suitcase, and it's a Best Pals tea set. That'll be out June 1st, uh, July 1st, mm-hmm. and then we're going to have our first boy doll named Wonderful. after our first brother, Danny, um, and it's called Danny Boy, and because um, when the four of us were born, Daddy, every time it was a girl... Dad would say to Mom, oh, I'm going to be too old to enjoy a boy. Oh, I'll never have any boys. <laughs> and so when our brother Dan was born, uh, Daddy made the four of us girls, we were the first four, the four of us girls kneel down and bow to him as he carried the, <laughs> our little brother th- through the front door when Mom came home from the hospital. And it's like we bowed to the little prince. Oh. So, uh, and then he had six boys. So, I mean, five boys. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he got his boys. <laughs> yeah, he got his boys. But, um, and then you mentioned before about our paper dolls. We have reproduced our paper dolls. Oh, wonderful. People will be excited to hear that. Yeah, very excited. And again, they can find them through bestpals.net and lennonsisters.com. And actually, um, they've been so successful in the last year that we are going to be uh, reproducing two more sets of our Wonderful. original Lennon Sister paper dolls. So we've got a lot going <laughs> at this point. And then, of course, yeah. we're still performing at the Welk Resort. And, and the Welk Resort gift shop have all our products also. People can always go online and go into the Welk uh, Resort gift shop. And then they have also lists. You can go in. Um, many, many doll stores have them. It's just, you know, all starting to happen now and yeah. um, we're, we're uh, thrilled about that and, and you're absolutely right mom had everything to do with this well it sounds like um, what she instilled in you in terms of love of family and valuing family you're an amazing example of somebody who has taken that um, commitment to family and incorporate it into every aspect of your life. I mean, even in your business ventures, even in your entertainment. I mean, I think that's why, of course, you resonate with all of us, is that um, y- you really represent that that can be done, you know, and that there's such hope in the future. As I told Kip and Pat, 
what I've always had a sense of in, in talking with all of you is just, you know, no matter what you've been through, there's that hope and that sense of, uh, of faith in the fact that the family uh, sustains you. And that's really what, you know, genealogy is all about. And I think that makes you a real gem. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Well, you know, the glory does go to mom and dad and to God. It just does. Yeah. We, you know, it's about being faithful no matter what you go through. Exactly. And, uh, we, have, we have a very special love connection. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, my... Uh, Speaking of Venice and Pat and Kip, and we talk to them as often as possible. It's been a very, it's been a real hardship to move to Branson, and half of us are here and half of us are there. Right. And we have never been separated in our life. Oh. So many families were and we weren't, and it is so hard. You want to be at every graduation. You want to be at every baseball game of Kippy's little boys. And, mm-hmm. and so I'm just on the phone all the time, or you know, I'm. So, so thankful for the internet because we send pictures back and forth and can be instantly in connection, you know. Um, but um, I, I am looking forward to, you know, your side, Lisa. I, I'm fascinated by it. I really am. And I, I would love to, my dream is also to follow the Alvarez family back. Um, that sounds like it's such an interesting. And then my grandmother, you know, Heinrich from Germany to follow them back. I have it back right. about oh, three generations on that. And um, but I haven't. I, I don't have a lot of time to <laughs> really do research. But um, I've done. A, I think I've done probably more, like you said, more than most of my family because I'm so interested in it. But I love to pass it on to the next, it were cousins or the next generation to continue with it uh, because I just have time for just so much. Well, if you send me the information that you have about the Alvarez family, I know that there are more and more Mexican records coming online every day. And I'll bet you, if we put a couple of our listeners on this, they would jump all over it and be able to dig up some things, and and we'll get back to you with that. Right, because it was um, the Alvarez was her father's name, Uh um, and Camacho was the mother's name, and she was from Spain. And I do have some names and dates, and uh, I know they had a lot of the Spanish land grants that were given them all in Southern California and then were taken away by the state. Right. And I even have some of those grants. Oh, wow. Copies of them. So um, that would be interesting. When I have a little bit of time and I'm just kind of... You know, sitting around doing, I know where a few things are. I can just send a few things off to you. Oh, do. I know that, that, that um, the listeners, we've got a couple of professional genealogists out there who listen and all kinds of people who will, um, I'm sure, be happy to do a little digging for you. <laughs> sure. And anytime your listeners have questions, uh-huh. you know, don't hesitate to email me. Okay. And then at least I can give you an answer on some of the things. And, Wonderful. Uh, we're, we're always honored. We have such loyal listeners. Mm-hmm. We have fans from the very beginning, and um, we are always honored by that. Well, I am honored that you took the time out to talk with me today to share your wonderful stories and inspiring stories about your family with all of us. Um, thank you so much, Kathy, for joining thank you, us. Lisa. Okay. All righty. Bye bye. to my house. Won't you come over and play? I have a dolly, a plaything or two. I live in the house across the way. I'll buy you candy and sweet things. I'll put your hair in a curl. Won't you come over to my house And play that you're my little girl I have a dear little dolly And her eyes are bright blue She can open and shut them And she smiles at me too In the morning I dress her And we go out to play But I like best to rock her at the close of the day. Rock-a-bye, baby, on the treetop. Rock-a-bye, baby, cradle and all. 
gosh, where has the time gone? Real quick, I have a couple of items for you. Uh, the Independence Day 20% discount on Genealogy Gems Premium Membership expires July 20th of 2008. I've extended that deadline from the 15th because this episode is actually coming out on the 14th of July, and I want to give you a couple more days to take advantage of that. And currently, one of the great advantages of being a premium member is that you'll be able to submit Ancestor handwriting samples to be considered for an upcoming handwriting analysis by Paula Sassy, our favorite certified graphologist. I'll be selecting handwriting samples that I think will be interesting to all the listeners. And you can get more information about that from premium episode number seven. And of course, now through July 31st, 2008, premium members can enter to win a pair of Best Pal dolls in a Best Pals tote bag autographed by Kathy and Janet Lennon of the Lennon Sisters. So members, you need to head over to the members forum to post a story of an ancestor's best pal or a memory of one of your own best pals. So lots of fun things to get involved with. But for now, I want to say thank you for listening, friend, and I'll talk to you soon.